Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly cyber threat intelligence briefing. Today is August 7th, and we'll be covering the most recent trends that our threat intelligence team has witnessed in the trenches. Uh, my name is Keith Wojcic, Global Head of Threat Intelligence. This week, we are joined by Senior Vice President George Glass, Vice President Akash Nagar, Senior Associate Ryan Hicks, all from our cyber threat intelligence team. Uh, we'll be covering the following trends our team is concentrating on. Uh, Ivanti update from George, spy note malware from Ryan, uh, phishing using the Google AMP from Akesh, and then another set of phishing uh, uh, vulnerabilities through Teams, and George is gonna provide an update on that. So from here, I'll send it over to George. George. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, hello, everyone. I've got an update on uh, the Avanti uh, mobile iron exploitation that we covered last week. Um, there's been some additional information shared by both Avanti and um, the CISA um, and uh, Norwegian National Security Authority. Um, just to remind you, CVE 2023-35078 uh, is the a vulnerability that allowed for information disclosure um, and potentially the, ad, the creation of administrative accounts. Following an update uh, last week um, with a vulnerability called uh, CVE 2023-35081, which was addressed and patched on the 28th of July by Avanti, um, it actually seems that this vulnerability was also used in the attacks that were seen um, uh, as part of the zero day exploitation of, of these vulnerabilities. And these um, this vulnerability also affects systems. So all of the releases from 11.10, 11.9 and 11.8. It also affects end of life systems, but they will not be receiving a patch for 35081. The Norwegian National Security Authority, um, as we mentioned last week, confirmed that the vulnerability had been exploited to attack government services. In addition to that, CISA released a report that details that um, 35078 um, had been exploited since April of this year, uh, which actually conflicts with some previous reporting. Um, this timeline is actually uh, a couple of months longer than what was previously reported. In addition to all of this, um, because of the, the nature of the vulnerability and, and how easy it is to find those uh, vulnerable um, API paths, um, the vulnerability has seen wider um, spread exploitation. Um, as you can see from the, the graph below, uh, which is from Grey Noise, um, an internet honeypot service, um, they saw a, a spate of exploitation on July 31st and then some continued uh, lower level um, exploitation uh, since then. Um, so this vulnerability is now no longer being just exploited by, by one threat group or, or threat actor. Um, it is apparently seeing wider uh, spread exploitation. And because of the updated uh, vulnerabilities, um, we, we now recommend to patch to the, the version shown on screen um, with the understanding that end of life systems did not receive a patch for 35081 whereas they did receive a patch for 35078. Uh, slightly confusing there, um, but uh, that's that's what we know on um, the Avanti situation um, as it presents itself now. And with that, I will hand back to Keith. Thank you. Thank you, George. I uh, really appreciate the update. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Ryan now to talk about Spino. Thanks, Keith. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so an Android uh, banking trojan called Spino um, has seen extensive use against customers of European banks in recent months uh, with the focus of carrying out banking fraud, uh, but also with it, the potential of, for account takeovers. Um, the delivery of Spino um, is typically started with a, a fake SMS message uh, where the user is asked to install a new secure app uh, and if the message, as if the message has come from uh, the bank um, itself. A second message is also sent um, that redirects the uh, victim to download the legitimate uh, TeamViewer app from the Google Play Store. Uh, and examples of those uh, are shown on, on the right there. Uh, the latter application, so TeamViewer, um, was observed uh, being used by the threat actors to conduct social engineering. Um, and they were essentially calling the, the victim um, after the, the message was, was sent through, uh, impersonating the bank staff. Um, and the victim likely um, sort of sent the actor their team viewer ID and password, uh, allowing act the actor to access their device, similar to how we uh, see um, threat actors use team view on um, other operating systems. Or uh, this then gave the threat actor the ability to control the victim's device and carry out uh, fraudulent transactions on the device itself. So that's kind of one half of the, the campaign. 
uh, and the second being uh, Spynote itself. Um, and like other uh, mobile malware families, um, Spynote relies on the accessibility services permissions granted um, by the user. Um, so this is where you usually get the kind of pop up um, asking for what permissions you um, would like to provide the program uh, or the app when you install. Uh, and when granted, it allows Spynote to accept subsequent permission pop ups automatically. Um, it's reported a number of sort of capabilities um, uh, once permissions are granted, and this includes uh, collecting SMS messages, uh, recording the audio and screen, uh, key logging activities, uh, and bypassing uh, two factor authentication. Uh, and although this campaign uh, targeted customers of banks, uh, the capabilities themselves and, and of similar um, kind of uh, malware, mobile malware families um, could also potentially pose a risk to um, organizations either using uh, corporate mobiles or allowing uh, employees to log into corporate environments on personal mobiles. Um, the two capabilities posing sort of such uh, those those such risks um, are the sort of key logging and the and the 2FA bypass where um, Spynote is able to gather uh, SMS messages received by the user such as um, authentication mes messages or, or codes um, and transmit them to um, the, the command and control server and it's also able to access um, temporary codes generated by uh, the Google Authenticator app um, further abusing the um, permissions allowed um, on install. So the, the capabilities and an overall purpose of Spynote is certainly not new in the, in the Android mail market. Uh, however, it really remains um, successful in conducting banking fraud on victims' devices. Uh, and as of course, personal devices are increasingly used for, for work purposes, um, this kind of potential attack surface um, for account takeovers from that vector uh, does increase greatly. Um, so really saying for, for this, um, really recommended that um, organizations provide user awareness on potential threats when using mobile devices for work purposes uh, and also consider um, technical controls uh, to mitigate this risk. We've, uh, within the report itself, we've um, listed um, some, some useful links for um, kind of um, some technical controls and recommendations for um, mobile devices, particularly within a corporate environment. Uh, with that, I'll hand back to Keith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I uh, really do appreciate that. Now we're going to talk about phishing. Uh, using uh, Google AMP uh, over to Makesh. Thank you, Keith. So, Google AMP is an open source HTML framework uh, developed by Google and several other partners. Uh, its main focus and purpose was designed to accelerate the loading of web content on mobile devices to uh, enhancing the user experience. Actors have now uh, found a way to exploit uh, Google AMP by embedding AMP URLs within phishing emails by using Google's reputable domain. Uh, they, uh, they can often bypass email protection technologies that rely on domain reputation checks. This means when that uh, recipients click on the AMP URL, they are redirected to the phishing site, making it uh, difficult to detect. Uh, as we can see on screen, uh, the way that Google AMP works is uh, you have a google.com forward slash AMP forward slash S forward slash, uh, which is the Google AMP URL, and following that is the phishing URL, which could be uh, the site which the actor wants the user to be directed to. Data from Confidence, an anti-phishing protection company, uh, revealed that uh, they've seen a notable increase in phishing attacks using this technique. Uh, the spike in activities occurred uh, between mid-July, indicating that threat actors were actively adopting this technique in order to improve their success rates. According to their data, approximately 77% of observed Google AMP URLs were hosted on the legitimate domain google.com while the remaining 23% were hosted on google.co.uk. One tactic uh, observed by the team was involves using image-based HTML emails instead of traditional text bodies. This uh, confuses the text scanners that typically search for common phishing terms in the message content. Additionally, some attacks included an extra redirection steps where attackers abused Microsoft.com's uh, URL to redirect victims to a Google AMP domain and subsequently the actual phishing site. 
uh, Cloudflare capture service was also used to prevent automated analysis by security bots and a way to keep crawlers from reaching the phishing page. It's important for organizations to stay uh, informed about these emerging uh, threats and tactics, as well as adopt a multi layered security approach. Uh, this should be a combination of email filtering, URL filtering, as well as having endpoint detection and response in place to detect uh, such phishing campaigns. Uh, we also recommend regular employee training and awareness programs uh, to enhance resilience against social engineering tech attacks that exploit human vulnerabilities. Uh, that's all from me. Back to you, Keith. Thanks, Vikash. Really do appreciate it. Uh, now we're going to wrap this up. We're going to talk back with George. George is going to talk about uh, teams and their phishing campaign. George. Thank you, Keith. Yep, some more phishing to make you aware of, um, this time uh, involving Microsoft Teams. Um, and this comes from a report from Microsoft themselves, uh, where they uh, release an advisory uh, on what they describe as a highly targeted uh, phishing attack um, attributed to uh, Russian state actors. Um, they they make uh, very clear that this has been used um, in very uh, targeted attacks so far. Um, but this also links back to what we uh, discussed, uh, I think, uh, last month um, about various ways of, of bypassing um, some of the, uh, the, the team security settings um, and uh, specifically a tool called uh, Teams Fisher. And this attack um, basically involves um, the, the threat actor compromising smaller businesses, um, but then leveraging their um, Microsoft 365 account to create um, devious subdomains. Um, and, and you can see an example here, which was provided by Microsoft. Um, they basically get that on Microsoft.com uh, domain, um, and then they can they can call the subdomain um, pretty much whatever they want. Um, the example here that, that we'll use is, is the, the team's uh, protection on Microsoft.com. They can then use that subdomain um, to uh, directly message um, a user um, of, of another team's domain um, with an account that they can create on that, that specific subdomain. Um, then when they receive the, the, the message, which you can see on the right hand side there, um, you know, it, it suddenly becomes very legitimate looking teams protection to um, you have to accept the, the external chat message, um, but from here, the threat actor can use a variety of, of social engineering tactics um, to uh, get the user to, to give them their um, MFA code, um, any tokens or API keys that they want. Um, and they're doing this usually in the guise of um, some sort of uh, internal IT support or Microsoft um, IT support. Um, Again, this is uh, not, not a particularly new tactic, but it's something that I, I think is uh, maybe a little bit less discussed. Um, we, you know, we talk a lot about email um, phishing, um, but nevertheless, there, there is a, you know, a whole new um, kind of paradigm of, of chat and messaging based uh, phishing attacks. Um, and this one, um, although you know, it involves compromising a, a small business, um, to, to prepare for it, um, the majority of the, the attack there, thereafter um, uses social engineering. Of course, this could also be used to deliver malware um, or, or indeed you know, use it to, to um, exfiltrate files from an organization as well. Um, so another one to be uh, aware of here. Um, and there's a number of um, recommendations that we provide in the, uh, the, the weekly threat intelligence report. Um, there's some uh, recommended teams and organization settings uh, that we share uh, from Microsoft themselves. Um, and again, I think this is another really good opportunity for, for user education just to uh, really reinforce the fact that you know, external um, communications um, could very well be malicious. And that's all from me. Back to you, Keith. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for sharing all of this updates, and we appreciate the time to tune in to the weekly Thread Intel briefing. We hope, that, we hope you found this session informative. And to end today, there's just a little known fact I'd like to share. In honor of National Raspberry and Cream Day, there are more than 200 species of raspberries. Now that I saw that today, I was a little shocked, but uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Eat some raspberries, honor uh, National Raspberry Day, and make sure you tune in to next week. Have a wonderful day and have a wonderful week. Thank you.